Air travel used to be twice as fast, and we made it slower on purpose. Concorde flew across the Atlantic in under three hours. Today, the same flight takes more than seven. And it wasn't technology that killed supersonic. It was silence, then spiraling costs, and finally politics, a law that banned speed itself. Fuel bills that doubled overnight and governments that built Concorde as a status symbol instead of a business. Two rivals now want to bring it back, and whoever wins could decide the future of flight. Cutting three hours from a flight turns a three-day business trip into two. That's one less hotel night, one less day of expenses for an employer, and one more night at home. Scale that across millions of travelers and the losses add up fast. On one major route alone, 10 million hours vanish every year. That's 300 million pounds, the price of three 787s, wasted simply because the flights are slower than they used to be. That's why this fight matters. Supersonic could flip air travel on its head and reshape our lives with it. Supersonic's future now hangs in a duel. In the United States, Boom is selling the Overture as a Concorde reborn. Glossy renders, splashy airline orders, and a prototype built for headlines, not hangers. While in Japan, engineers claim that they've solved the Boom itself, reshaping sound into silence. Yet their last passenger jet burned through billions and was scrapped before it ever flew. On one side, it's trading in promises, and the other in patience. So whoever wins will decide whether aviation keeps regressing or finally moves forward again. The world built a jet twice as fast as anything before it. Then in 1973, the US banned supersonic flight over land. Every time the Concorde broke the sound barrier, it sounded like an explosion in the sky. Windows rattled and the public hated it. And the FAA drew a line. No sonic booms over towns. From then on, Concorde could only go supersonic over oceans. Imagine if we banned jet airliners in the 1950s because propeller planes were quieter. Self-sabotage. For 50 years, that one decision locked us into slower flights. Then the economics. Concorde was a rocket with seats. Thrilling for passengers, but catastrophic for balance sheets. 25,000 liters an hour. That's about the same as the fuel burn on a 747 seat for seat. And with only 300,000 passengers flying on the Concorde annually, that was only the same as about one week on the 747. By the 1990s, a round trip ticket cost about 11,000 pounds, double a 747 first class fare, and 10 times economy. The Concorde was great at making headlines and terrible at making profit. Even Air France admitted it was flying purely for prestige. Concorde was also born as a Cold War status symbol, not a market-driven jet. Britain and France teamed up to prove Western prowess, sparing no expense. The budget exploded from £160 million to over £1.2 by 1975. That's roughly £11 billion today, enough to buy nearly 90 Airbus A350s. In the end, only 14 Concords ever entered service, and only the Air France and British Airways ran sustained scheduled services. Dozens were once on order, but every other airline walked away once they saw the cost. That political vanity project was the final nail. Concorde became a flying propaganda piece, a symbol of national pride on jet fuel. Concorde wasn't a business, it was a government-funded moonshot. But its brand legacy still matters. Concorde created a halo around British Airways and Air France, the only airlines offering a different level of glamour and speed. It's like Emirates putting showers on the A380. Few experienced it, but everyone knew about it. For decades, the dream lay buried. Today, Two challengers insist that they can revive it. So what happens when someone tries again? The battle to revive faster than sound flight has become a face-off. In one corner is Boom Supersonic, a flashy American startup hawking an audacious pitch to airlines and investors. And in the other, we've got Japan's methodical government-backed push to build a quiet jet. Both claim that they've learned from Concorde's failure and promised to succeed where it fell short. But their strategies couldn't be more different. This is hype versus hush, speed versus silence, Boom versus Japan. Boom is all about selling the fantasy. Its proposed airliner, the Overture, is pitched as a 70-seat jet that could cross the Atlantic in three and a half hours. To fuel the hype, Boom has rolled out sleek renderings and splashy order announcements from big airlines. United claims it wants 15, American says 20, and even Japan Airlines invested with an option for more. Together, these headlines boast over 100 jets, but not a single one is firm. It looks good in the headlines, but means nothing in reality. United or American can walk away tomorrow without paying a penny. Is Boom selling a revolution or just smoke? 
Overture has no engine, and none exist today that can do the job. Without one, the bird will never fly. A handful of giants, GE, Pratt & Whitney, and maybe Rolls-Royce, have built engines from scratch before, but not for a project with this little guaranteed demand, which makes Boom's challenge even steeper. The startup went begging to those very engine makers, and every one of them walked away. I mean, Rolls-Royce signed on for a couple of years and then bailed in 2022. I want to see Boom succeed. Cutting transatlantic flights flight times in half would upend the premium travel market overnight. But the reality is brutal. This project is missing its single most important piece, an engine that can deliver the promised speeds. With Rolls-Royce gone, Boom is attempting the impossible, building the engine itself. It's cobbled together a small patchwork of small suppliers to work on an in-house design that they've codenamed Symphony. Right now, Symphony exists more on PowerPoint than in metal. Ask yourself, when was the last time a startup built a jet engine from scratch? Never. Yes, Boom touts its one-third scale demonstrator, the XB1 prototype, which did break the sound barrier in 2024, but that jet runs on repurposed military engines, not anything new. It's a PR stunt, not proof that Overture can work. Meanwhile, 5,000 miles away, another team thinks that they can kill Boom's biggest headache by silencing it. Japan has a vision of its own. Through the space agency JAXA, engineers have spent nearly two decades chasing a low boom supersonic concept. It's a 50-seat airliner designed to cruise at Mark 1.6, but more importantly, to reshape its shockwaves into a softer thump. Quiet enough, they hope, to be allowed over land. Silence the boom, and suddenly routes Concorde was banned from become fair game. And here's the kicker. If Japan succeeds, it unlocks a market that boom can't touch, supersonic over land. Unlike boom, Japan isn't rushing to collect airline orders or court press coverage. It's playing the long game in R&D. The team in Nagoya has been quietly tackling the physics of sonic booms. They've even dropped models from high altitude balloons to measure shockwaves, but years of lab tests don't sell tickets. The real test is whether Japan can turn diagrams into a jet that you can board. Japan's effort comes with a weak spot. The country has never successfully built and certified a passenger airliner from scratch. Can Japan actually build this thing? Sure. Japanese factories build key parts of Boeing's 787 Dreamliner, and that's proof of world-class skill. But assembling pieces for Boeing certainly isn't the same as creating an entire aircraft. Mitsubishi found out the hard way. Its space jet program, a 90-seat regional airliner, dragged on for 15 years and burned nearly £9 billion, only to be cancelled in 2023 without having ever entered service. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries admitted it simply lacked the know-how to get the planes certified. It was a national embarrassment, and if Japan couldn't even get a subsonic regional jet off the ground, why should anyone believe that they could reinvent the Concorde at Mark 1.6? Here's the bigger picture. Concorde wasn't buried by a lack of ingenuity. It was noise, fuel, and regulation that doomed it. Five decades later, those same forces still hang over any supersonic revival. Boom and Japan know it, and that's why one is lobbying politicians while the other fine-tunes quiet designs in the lab. Both betting laws change before physics does, and they might actually be in luck. The United States has already started loosening the rules, promising to lift its overland supersonic ban if new jets can meet future low-boom standards. Supersonic won't come back because of science. It will come back when politicians smash the rule book. One regulation and one stroke of a pen is all that it took to lock the Concorde into flying over the ocean. The most profitable routes, New York to Los Angeles, coast to coast, were banned overnight. This decision alone stopped the development of supersonic aircraft for 50 years. In 1973, the US banned supersonic flight over land, a decision meant to shield communities from the thunder of sonic booms. It also locked Concorde out of America's skies, cutting it off from the most profitable routes. Transcontinental runs like New York to Los Angeles. In 2024, Delta alone made nearly 450 million US dollars on that corridor, one of its top revenue routes. That's the kind of money Concorde never touched, and that's why the fight to overturn the ban is so fierce. Washington is now rewriting the rule book to let its jets break the sound barrier again, provided they can do it quietly under new low boom standards. Politicians who once preached caution now boast about making aviation great again. The message from the top? 
let the sonic booms roar. But scrapping a law doesn't erase the problems. Noise, fuel burn and the politics piled on top still stand and the moment the ban began to crumble, a new fight took off. Supersonic is now a proxy war over climate and privilege. Class politics are dragged in too, whether anyone likes it or not. On one side, aerospace CEOs and their political allies promise a future where you can jet from New York to Los Angeles in two hours, selling it as innovation unchained. On the other, environmental groups call it a giant leap backwards, a noisy, carbon-hungry indulgence for the ultra-rich. A coalition of NGOs warns that next-gen supersonic jets will emit five to seven times more CO2 per passenger kilometer than today's flights. That's essentially like flying with seven empty seats next to you. Even with greener fuel, that scale of burn still means far higher emissions. The clash is no longer about noise and fuel burn alone, it's about values. Do we price speed above climate goals? Do we accept elite comfort at the expense of public nuisance? Supersonic, once a triumph of technology, is now a litmus test for what kind of progress we choose to pursue. And while the West argues, China is skipping the debate entirely. Beijing saw Concord collapse and drew a blunt lesson. Speed is power. Chinese engineers have already tested hypersonic prototypes at Mark IV. Not airliners, but military weapons. And now the Communist Party claims that by 2049, the centenary of the People's Republic, it will unveil a silent supersonic passenger jet that flies farther than Concorde ever could. Comac's Mark 1.6 jet is pitched as a low-boom airliner, but it's defense research in disguise. Born in missile labs under a system that treats every aircraft as a military asset. Forget ticket sales, the prize is dominance over speed itself. For China, supersonic is another battlefield, and American companies know it. One US startup admits supersonic is a race, and China wants the crown. In the West, debate stalls progress. And in China, the party decrees it and industry falls in line. Public opinion and regulators still wrestle with noise, fuel and climate. In China, the state orders it and it happens. Speed is not debated, it is decreed. And even if the technology works, does anyone believe it comes back for the masses? At best, it's a rich man's niche or a national trophy. This time, it might actually work. The winners are obvious. Business elites, the airlines flogging ultra-premium tickets, and the startups behind the planes. Halving a transatlantic trip hands raw leverage to those who can afford it. And the supposed losers? I don't buy it. For most travelers, this could be an opening. If the ultra-rich trace speed at any cost, subsonic carriers will have no choice but to slash prices in their premium cabins. Business class could finally shift into reach for a far larger share of passengers, still comfortable, but no longer the preserve of the elite. Supersonic 2.0 is a power grab dressed up as progress. Concorde was a Cold War trophy and today's revival is fueled by capital, ambition, and politics. For 50 years, this was the end of the line, and the next attempt is going to have to pay or they'll die trying. Supersonic isn't about mass transit. It's about who controls speed, and whoever owns it, owns the future. Make no mistake, if only the 1% fly supersonic, the rest of us will still feel the turbulence. Supersonic could upend not just fares, but global business. Faster flights mean tighter deal making, revive face-to-face -face meetings, and a world stitched back together at speed after years of Zoom calls. Now add Project Sunrise, direct Sydney to London flights. Supersonic gives you speed, Sunrise gives you reach, and for the first time since Concord, aviation is about to jump. Supersonic is more than a luxury toy. It could be the spark that drags aviation forward, even for those who never step on board. For the first time in half a century, flying is daring to get faster again. So tell me, is supersonic the ultimate symbol of privilege or the best chance we've had in 50 years to make flying better for everyone? For the Sky Digest, I'm Jan. Speed isn't fair, it never was. Cheers.